Hi, welcome to Fundamentals Friday. Today we're going to take a look at ripple and noise measurement and specifications. You're familiar with it, you've seen it on your power supply, your bench power supply that you've got lying around, no doubt. You see that ripple and noise measurement? They might give a typical value for a PSU like 1 millivolt RMS slash 5 millivolts peak to peak ripple and noise. What exactly does that mean? What's ripple and what's noise and how do you measure it? What are the traps for young players? Well, I'm glad you asked. So what does ripple mean? Let's take a look at that first. And you're almost certainly familiar with this term. You've seen it used in terms of linear power supply, for example, and we'll get into that. Now, it can be correctly described as the charge discharge cycle of the storage element in whatever power supply you're actually using, be it linear or switch mode. There's a bit of confusion there. People think ripple only uh, is 50, 60 hertz mains hum, that sort of stuff out of your traditional linear supply that you're used to here. Half-wave half wave bridge rectifier, for example, and your capacitor, then, well, you'll get that 50 hertz slash 60 hertz, depends on where you are, ripple on the output of full-wave bridge rectifier, you'll get double that frequency. And you've seen that, it's a basic uh, building block thing, you've no doubt mucked around it with your scope if you're a beginner. but that ripple, uh, the term ripple also applies to a switch mode power supply, a DC to DC converter. Let's take, for example, this uh, buck uh, converter here, which you know converts a higher voltage down to a lower voltage. The storage element in this case is the inductor here and the charge discharge cycle of the inductor in the switch mode converter. And that will give you you know, it doesn't look quite as smooth usually as your uh, mains frequency, which uh, is derived from the uh, mains, which is of course a sine wave. You don't generally get a sine wave, but you might get something sort of funny looking like that, but it's still going to be periodic and relatively low frequency. In terms of a switch mode power supply, could be, you know, tens of kilohertz up to a couple of hundred kilohertz, maybe even a megahertz or two or something like that. But it's generally defined as that base frequency of the discharge and charging of your storage element, be it your uh, rectifier here or your inductor in your DC to DC converter. So that sort of base frequency. And well, what is noise? <laughs> Easy, noise is everything else. Um, pretty much, mainly due to, in terms of a switch mode power supply, for example, you generally won't get noise in just a linear power supply like this unless it's being coupled in via something else. But in a DC to DC converter, for example, you can get parasitic inductances all over the place and they can cause uh, some high frequency noise or ringing when you've got large DIDT technical term. It just means large changes in current over time which you get charging and discharging your storage element. These uh, parasitic inductances generally much lower inductive values so therefore they're going to ring and generate noise at a higher frequency. So you'll find that the noise typically will have sort of you know noise superimposed on there like that. I can't draw it in there, but you'll see that it'll have much more higher frequency content. And that's generally what noise is. And in terms of power supply specifications, well, they lump them all together and say ripple and noise. So they combine the two and they give you two figures. They give you a peak to peak value, of course, which is your value from there to there, your absolute maximum peak to your absolute minimum, and they also give you a value in RMS as well. At least your good suppliers do. You know, your cheap ass supplies, they might just give you the RMS value big as well. Marketing wank, right? The RMS value is always going to be lower than the peak to peak value. Now, I've done videos on noise before, and you should probably know from those that a noise figure is generally pretty useless unless you specify it over a particular bandwidth. And well, what is it in the case of power supplies? Well, a lot of manufacturers will not tell you. So there's actually no real standard for it as such. Pretty much manufacturers will just throw a number out there, one millivolt RMS, they won't even give you the bandwidth. What does it mean? In fact, they won't even tell you what current it is at because the ripple and noise is going to change with your output current. The uh, noise, for example, the parasitics in the adductors, the value of uh, the change in uh, current with time that 
I talked about there, well, that's going to vary with your output current. So the uh, voltage and noise figures, well, unless the manufacturer actually specifies it, you've actually got no clue. It's, it's kind of almost meaningless, but there is a semi de facto standard for it, and that's 20 megahertz bandwidth. So generally, if it's not mentioned, that's what the manufacturer is really pretty much telling you that it should be over a 20 megahertz bandwidth, both ripple and noise. Hence why your oscilloscope has that bandwidth button on it and it's 20 megahertz or vice versa. The uh, bandwidth figure was taken from the fact that scopes actually had 20 megahertz bandwidth limit in on and your analog uh, scopes for a long time had sort of like a base level 20 megahertz bandwidth. So really I, the number was just sort of eh, picked out of the air pretty much. But most scopes should have that 20 megahertz bandwidth limit on it and if they don't, well, if you're using the wide bandwidth of your scope, you're going to get the wrong result. You're not measuring it properly. So if your scope doesn't have that, hey, you might have to build up an external filter to put inside. And that's all there is to the theory, pretty much. In fact, I've probably spoken longer than I should. Let's go to the bench. So let's take a look at two typical power supplies here. We've got this Powertech MP3090. It's actually a Manson uh, 9400. I've done a teardown of this before. It's just rebranded and it's just a high current switch mode uh, power supply, not really a bench uh, power supply as such. And then you've got your higher quality Rigol DP832 up here. Let's take a look at their data sheets. So here's the Manson 9400, and well, look, it's pretty basic. Ripple and noise, 10 millivolts RMS. As I said, they're just too scared to put in the peak-to-peak -peak figure in there, and they don't even specify a bandwidth or anything like that. And of course, they don't specify what output current it's over, but almost no manufacturer actually specifies what output current it's actually at, or different values for different uh, output currents. So it's generally taken, the ripple and noise figure, generally taken to mean at the maximum output current or maximum output uh, power point. And here's the Rigol DP832, and look at this, much better. Here we go, ripple and noise, and they specify the bandwidth, 20 hertz to 20 megahertz. There's the de facto industry standard there of 20 megahertz, but hey, it may not always be. So there you go, normal voltage mode, here it is. Is, once again, they've lumped them together, uh, and we've got uh, less than 350 microvolts RMS slash 2 millivolts peak to peak. So that's a pretty low noise power supply. So which one actually means more to you, the RMS value or the peak to peak value? Well, actually, that's up to you and your requirements for the circuit you're actually powering. But generally speaking, the peak to peak value is really, you know, that's the one that's going to uh, be a pain in the ass because you will get those peaky spikes out of it, as we'll see on the scope. So you might think it's pretty easy to measure the ripple and noise of your power supply. Just hook your oscilloscope probe up to the output like that and and measure it with or without a load on there. But hey, that's rule number one, is that uh, generally the ripple and noise is gonna be higher at higher loads. So you generally wanna test it at either the maximum output current or your intended output current for your circuit under test, for example. So we've got a five volt output here and I've got it connected up to my BK Precision uh, constant current load up here and I've set it for two amps. So there it is, it's drawing two amps. Let's go over the scope and see how we set it up. And because power supply measurements are typically going to be low amplitude values, like in the terms of millivolts or even sub millivolt, really you want the best scope you can get with the lowest noise front end with uh, if possible, you know, a good one millivolt per division range, or in this case, the Rigol 2000 series scope has a 500 microvolt per division range. Fantastic, ideal for testing uh, power supply uh, stuff like this, or pretty much as we'll get into. Anyway, the way you want to set it up is, well, here's channel one, uh, feeding our signaling. You always want AC coupling. You've got to remove that uh, DC content, of course. Bandwidth limit, very important because we have to measure over the bandwidth. We can disable, well, we can go into, say, 100 megahertz or turn it off and look at that. That is the difference between having your full bandwidth or your what the actual specification is over a 20 megahertz bandwidth. So if your scope doesn't have that, hey, you'll have to add a series filter in there. And I've set up normal mode manual triggering on this so I can adjust the trigger level. And, well, look, I can get it to not trigger at all. Barely, oh yeah, we've got a big spike there, but barely because I'm adjusting the trigger level 
like that. It can be tricky to actually trigger on uh, noise like this. So generally you want your uh, trigger threshold maybe on a noise peak like that, for example. So anyway, um, generally you don't want to use your auto triggering mode. Sometimes it's not going to work very good. Anyway, um, what we've got is our RMS value. The scope can tell us the RMS value. Before scopes could calculate this sort of thing, you would typically use a wide bandwidth uh, multimeter specifically for the task with a true RMS uh, value mode to give you the RMS value but these days your oscilloscopes can do it and we've got look a current value of not sure if you can read that but it's like 2.6 millivolts or something like that and these are the statistics average and then the peak to peak so there's our two figures we've got 20 you know almost up to 20 millivolts peak to peak there and of course we can uh, freeze that and actually take a look at the waveform what we're typically getting that's pretty ugly, pretty noisy, but hey, we've got some basic figures there. But you might notice something here. I've used a times a fixed times 10 probe for this thing. Well, that's not so great when you're doing noise low level measurements like this. You don't want to be using that divider probe, really. So you want to stick in a times one probe. So I've changed that to a times one probe, and uh, there it is. I've set it up as times one. And we're basically getting similar values to what we got before, similar waveform, but you're going to get uh, better signal fidelity out of your times one probe because you're not dividing it down. But another trap is that with a times one probe, as you've seen in previous video I've done, is that a times one, the bandwidth of a times one probe can actually be pretty low in the order of like 10 or 20 megahertz. So just check the data sheet for your particular, uh, if you're going to use a scope probe like this, check your particular probe and what bandwidth, because you may not be measuring over a 20 megahertz bandwidth anymore. You may actually be limited by the bandwidth of your scope probe. There you go. I'll link in the video for that down below if you haven't seen it. You've got an older scope with limited memory depth uh, during regular sampling, then you might need to use peak detect mode. In fact, you probably should, you know, as a general rule, be using peak detect mode so that it can actually detect the absolute peaks and you're not missing it based on your time base and your memory depth and stuff like that. So if you want your true peak to peak reading, it should be in peak detect mode. That's what it's there for. And just to show you how that ripple and noise changes with load, well, that's with my 2 amp load. If I turn off my 2 amp load, bingo, look at that, big difference. So, yeah, make sure you know and specify what load current you're testing it at. But you guessed it, I've deliberately added a trap for young players here. The probing method that I've just shown you before is actually wrong. You shouldn't be doing it like this. And I'll show you why. It won't be a huge example. I could probably set up a better example, but you'll at least see the difference. At the moment, I've got my LED uh, studio lights above me, and they're pulse width modulated. And uh, those things generate you know, a whole bunch of noise which gets coupled into our test system here and our test leads and everything else. Absolutely horrible stuff. So what happens if I turn off my lights here? Watch the waveform. You won't see a huge change, but you should see a difference. Ready? There we go. And if I switch them back on, there we go. You actually get a bit more noise and it can actually be a lot worse than that depending on the scenario and how it's actually been picked up. In fact I'll show you a much better example of let let's hook it up to my Rigol 832 power supply exactly the same as before five volts out we're drawing two amps into our load over here and I've got my standard uh, oscilloscope probe times one with our earth lead on there. Let's check this one out. And as you can see, totally different waveform, totally dominated by the, you know high frequency noise content because this is a linear power supply as opposed to a switching power supply that we saw before. And we're down to one millivolt per division here. Let's that's with my lights on. Let's turn it off. Ready? Ta-da! Look at that! Huge difference. Let's switch it back on. Whoa! Look at all that! That is common mode noise being picked up by our piss poor test connection. We didn't do it right. So the next rule of power supply ripple and noise testing, don't use your big antenna earth lead like that. It's a huge inductor just picking up all sorts of crap. So instead what I'm going to get is a BNC adapter like that and I've got a banana plug to BNC like that and I'm just going to plug that into our uh, power supply 
much better. So we don't, I mean, I can still leave this lead dangling off here. It's not doing anything anymore. But generally, you take that out and then we can plug it straight in. Nice low impedance, low inductance path through to our power supply connection right at the test connection, by the way. You always want to measure it right on the output and not way over here. You don't want to measure it over here because, well, that is just going to pick up all sorts of crap. Forget it. So there we have it, beautiful low inductance path directly in, our load connected directly across there, probing via the BNC, fully shielded, no big inductive path. That's as good as we can possibly get for measuring the output of a bench power supply like this. And what does that give us? Look at that, and that's with my lights on. Look, I'll switch them off, and ta-da, look, it adds very little high frequency noise to that. Where's it? One millivolt per division. We can actually go down to 500 microvolts per division because this scope is really, really good. And look, we really can't see those lights. Oh, switch them on. Yeah, there we go. We've added a little bit more, but it's nothing like before. It's like, you know, half an order of magnitude less than what we're getting before because we've got a proper low inductance shielded test connection. But now the problem is with that what's called single-ended connection that we're testing with at the moment, that, that's good and you can do power supply testing like this, but it's not absolutely ideal because we still don't know where our noise sources are coming from. Look, we've got some spikes here. I could probably try and uh, trigger off those, but you can see it drifting across like that. Are they being generated in so that by the supply or is it coming from something external, uh, something, you know, and we're getting common mode coupling onto our cable? Well, I don't know. And for those curious to see what it looks like on a real old fashioned analog scope, which is still the best choice for something like this, well, here's my Tektronix 2225. Once again, it's also very rare on the market. That's got a 500 microvolts per division vertical range. And see, you know, we can see a bit more detail in the high frequency content in there but we could also probably see that on our digital if we actually stopped and zoomed in and stuff like that but there you go we're seeing we're also seeing some of that uh, noise which we're not sure if that's still common mode noise uh, common mode pickup from something or what but there you go generally basically exactly the same thing we were seeing before on our analog scope and there you go i've got that a bit better on the uh, digital scope over here. I've uh, triggered manually now so I'm in there and I've got uh, AC coupling. I've got some noise reject on as well. I don't think that matters a huge amount but I've got it set to normal and I'm just holding my tongue at the right angle and uh, tweaking that trigger level and you know pretty much uh, we can capture that and of course then zoom in on any of the uh, detail. We were sort of seeing that a bit clearer on the analog uh, type stuff but that is your high frequency noise and the rest of it is that low frequency content like that is your ripple. And of course we can trigger on that uh, ripple because we can go into our source for our triggering and we can trigger off the AC line there. There we go, that's the 50 hertz. So there you go, it doesn't drift anymore so you know that is your ripple. But of course that sort of line triggering of course only works for a linear power supply where you're going to get that uh, 50, 60 or 100, 120 hertz ripple on the thing. You're not going to be able to do that on a switch mode power supply which has a free running frequency for its switching converter. Now this is our best possible single ended test connection we can get for a bench power supply like this. Well, what happens if you want to measure your own uh, design or measure one of these little brick converters or something like that? Let's take a quick look at that. So to measure your own supply or a, a brick converter like this, for example, or something on any PCB, switching, be it switch converter or linear, for example, you always take measure the output directly on the output filter capacitor like that. I'm not sure exactly which one it is here. I'm presuming it's these, this big ceramic capacitor here. So you'll put your scope probe directly across that capacitor with as low an inductance uh, probing technique as possible. So you might use one of your little uh, low inductance um, ground uh, spring clip adapters that you should have got with any uh, decent set of scopes and you would probe it directly across there like that or as I've shown in previous videos you can actually uh, solder a bit of uh, you know dedicated wire on there like a little hook and loop 
So you can basically uh, make one of these out of a wire, solder directly on the board, and then stick your probe right in like that. You want the lowest inductance path possible. Forget about using this garbage. Ah, oh, it's an antenna. Now I said this was the best single-ended method possible. And, well, by single-ended, your scope probe is a single-ended probe, i.e. it's got uh, your input and a ground, basically. That is a single-ended test connection. Well, that is not ideal, because we still aren't 100% sure of the, of the no noise on our scope. Is it common mode noise, or is it actually coming out of the power supply? The only way to be absolute sure, and the best possible and recommended way to measure ripple and noise of any power supply is not to use a single-ended scope probe like this but to use a differential probe. Now you might be familiar with a high voltage differential probe like this LaCroix AP031 and these are fantastic to have and the tool for measuring high voltage stuff because they have differential input like this. Yes, there's a positive and negative, but it's a differential input, not single-ended, uh, and it can tolerate high common mode voltages on the input. But, and, and it gives you a single-ended output, so it converts differential to single-ended output that goes into your scope like this. But this is actually useless for our task here because this is designed for high voltages, it's not low noise, and it only has uh, 110 or 1 one hundredth attenuation. So, no good at all. What you need is a proper differential probe and or uh, differential probe with a pre-amplifier on the input. Now the Ducks Guts is one of these, it's a uh, LaCroix, has very high bandwidth, higher than the 20 megahertz required, but hey, it costs thousands and thousands of dollars. So pretty much there's not much on the market in terms of proper differential probing for doing power supply measurements like this. Now there's a poor man's way to do this, but it actually works kind of reasonably well and gives you a good ballpark indication of whether or not uh, you've got common mode noise or not. And that's to use a, uh, the old technique of having using the dual channel of your scope and getting a differential measurement that way. You'll notice I've got the two scope probes here, but there is no ground connection at all. It's just the center connection on both uh, the positive and negative of our power supply. So the grounds are not connected at all. Our oscilloscope, of course, is mains earth reference. So we're going to get all sorts of crap coming from each channel. But when you subtract one channel from the other, bingo, it should get rid of all that crap and give you a true differential measurement across there. Now, the way to do this on an old-fashioned analog scope uh, and a digital as well, but I'll show you analog first. Uh, we've got both our inputs here. Must Both must be AC coupled. Both must be set to the exact same vertical uh, attenuation range. In this case, I've got 5 millivolts per division. I've pulled out my times 5 uh, times 10 magnifier, so we're 500 microvolts per division, channel 1 and channel 2. We're displaying, uh, we've got both channels active and we're inverting channel 2. That's important because an analog oscilloscope doesn't have a subtract function. It's only got an add function. But if you have channel 1 plus the inverse of channel 2, that gives you subtraction. So there we go. We're on add mode. We're channel 2 invert. And uh, as I said, it's important that these two are uh, exactly the same range. Otherwise, if you've got that cowl, make sure your cowl's adjusted correctly. Otherwise, it's going to be completely out of the shop and of course this is a big reason why this isn't a very good technique you don't get good common mode rejection ratio uh, using these no, common mode rejection using this technique but it's good enough but look what, what the hell is this what is this it's hopeless it doesn't work at all well, the reason is we've got no ground connection between the scope and our system under test. So it's picking up a whole bunch of common mode garbage on both these channels and it can't deal with it. So we have to really knock that uh, common mode uh, stuff on the head by adding a couple of 50 ohm terminators on the input. If your scope has 50 ohm termination, turn it on. So let's plug both our channels back in with, I've got a series 50 ohm terminator on each one and Bingo, look at that, we're now in subtract mode. As I said, if you muck around with uh, any of the vertical uh, settings, if they're not completely matched like that, 
you're just it's just not going to happen and of course if you don't invert channel 2 eh, you're screwed you're just looking at that and bingo we're getting bugger all there and you expect it to be bugger all because well the uh, Rigol is a very good power supply let's go over to a better example a much higher noise you know we can't go any further on a vertical let's go back to that horrible Manson switch in power supply so there you go that's the test connection back on our Manson supply there exactly the same load we had before and bingo, look at that. There we go. There's our Manson power supply output. There's some of the high frequency stuff in there. We can actually turn our alt zoom on and we can actually see the zoomed value of that, a zoomed part of that uh, noise in there. Look at that. So there's our ripple and there's our noise using our differential measurement on our analog scope like that. And we should get exactly the same on the digital. Let's go back and try that. And we're back on our Rigol here. Here's our channel 1, channel 2 input. And I've got the math operator on A minus B there. And as you can see, it's a bit slow updating on the screen there. But we're basically getting exactly the same waveform we get before with some high frequency content in there we weren't seeing on our analog scope. So what we'll do is we'll just expand that out a bit. We'll go to our acquire menu here and we're in normal acquisition at the moment. We'll change that to our high res mode with our box car averaging. And bingo, look at that. There we go. We're getting exactly the same waveform we're getting on that analog scope there on our digital scope. But the waveform updating, eh, a little bit slow. And that's one of the problems with the Rigol scope and a lot of other scopes on the market. They will do all that math function in, you know, processing in software. So it takes actually time when you turn those math functions on. That's why they're slow updating. If we go to our Agilent uh, 3000 series scope here, it does all the math uh, stuff and in direct hardware on the ASIC. So it is much better, much quicker updating. But the problem is this scope only goes down to one millivolt per division, but it really only has a true two millivolt per division. The one millivolt is actually just a software tweak. So we don't get the greatest fidelity out of our waveform here. So in that respect, the Rigol scope with its true low noise 500 microvolt front end, much better for this purpose. And here's an interesting thing to note. What I'll do is I'll adjust the gain here on the, well, the scale of our math function. We're currently at one millivolt per division there. So I'll tweak that down here and you'll notice, look at that, you start, if I go up one to uh, 500 microvolts per division, you start seeing the individual bits in there of the math calculation. So this is uh, you know, one of the disadvantages of a digital scope and one of the advantages of the analog. Once you get down to with large differences and dynamic range, you've only got that 8-bit converter in there to play with. So really, you know, look, you can start to see the individual, individual bits there. It's just crazy. L look at that. But hey, at least we can see our waveform. So that's pretty good. And that value is going to change with our scale here. If we turn our vertical uh, up, of course, we get increased fidelity and resolution in that calculated math value because it's only got those eight bits to work with or more if it's the high res mode. But let's take it down to, say, five millivolts per division on both channels. Look at that. Totally blocky because the signal, the amplitude, is down in the noise. So it can only calculate. Look, you've only got a couple of bits down in there. Ah, it's bugger all. So when you're using a digital scope, just make sure you maximize the uh, use of your dynamic range of your uh, front end by using the lowest uh, vertical scale possible. And here's another trap for digital scopes as well. There's our waveform. What happens if we move our, one of our channels off outside the range of the ADC? So it's clipping. Look, look at that. Our calculated math value just goes to complete garbage. That's one of the advantages of analog scopes. Digital, bleh, look at that, that's awful. Real trap if you don't know what you're looking for. But if you were observant, you would have noticed that our amplitude here that we're getting is much lower than what we were getting. Our differential uh, waveform here is much lower in value, in amplitude, than we're getting with that single-ended connection. Why? We're still using times one probes here. Nothing's really changed. We're just subtracting one signal from the other. We should get the same value, but we're not. Remember, look at our scale. It's 500 microvolts per division here, and it's basically I can uh, go in there into the math function and adjust the tweak that up. It's like, you know, two divisions sort of peak to peak there. What we're getting before, 
we're getting what about 10 millivolts peak to peak about 10 times more so what I've set up here in parallel is our single-ended connection as well. Yeah, you can do this. Ordinarily you wouldn't, but we're going to get away with it here. So we've got a single-ended and our differential probing it as well. So I've got the, yeah, the proper high-frequency connection there. It's going, that third channel now single-ended is going to our Agilent scope because our Rigel scope is only two channels. So let's have a look. So there's the single-ended measurement on our Agilent scope. Look, 2 millivolts per division. You know, 2, 4, you know, it's almost 6. Sort of, you know, something like that. Hey, yeah, let's not dick around with the triggering. And if we go up here and have a look at our differential measurement, then, as we said, we're 500 microvolts per division, so we're barely even 1 millivolt there, peak to peak. So there's about a 6-odd times difference. Where is that coming from? Well, if you remember a previous video I've done, which I'll uh, link in, in that um, the how these uh, oscilloscope probes work, the coax cable isn't just a direct connection straight through. It actually uses a lossy coax, which means it has a resistance in it. And we can actually measure that. Look, let's get our multimeter here. Here we go, and measure our center conductor, which you'd expect to be a dead short. It's not. It's about 330 ohms. Aha! We've got a 50 ohm terminator on our scope to get rid of all that uh, crap. And bingo, we've got a voltage divider. So if you work out how much the signal's being divided time by, well, it's roughly seven and a half times with that 330 ohms and the 50 in there. So that's why our amplitude on our differential measurement is so low. So to get the true value that you're actually measuring, you have to multiply that by the measured probe, but in this case, well, you wouldn't be using scope probes for this measurement. So I've actually, uh, another trap for young players is when you're doing this sort of stuff, you wouldn't be using a scope probe like this. It's good enough to get an indication like this to see if there's any, uh, you know, get rid of any common mode noise or something like that. But hey, in this case, it is not the correct method. You should be using direct coax, 50 ohm loaded, so what we get down to is the ultimate correct method to do differential probing like this. If you don't have a proper, you know, really expensive uh, high impedance differential probe, this is how you would do it. You'd have your coax from the scope, of course, 50 ohm terminated on the end here, and you would have a 50 ohm uh, source resistance in here as well. And just to get rid of any DC out of there, you would have AC coupling in both lines, and that is that becomes your differential probe. But with the 250 ohms in there, you've still got an attenuator. So your final value that you're measuring, hey, you've still got to multiply it by two. So there you go. But that is how you would do proper differential measurement with a scope or with a preamplifier. Usually you would, uh, you know, use the differential measurement into a preamplifier, especially for doing something like the Rigol scope here, which has noise we can't really measure, you know, with even with our 500 microvolts per division here. It's just not really doable. So you would typically, you know, whack in a times 10 preamplifier or something like that in there. Yes, you could do this with two single-ended uh, preamplifiers if you wanted to with your scope and stuff like that. And, you know, that would still work. But a proper differential amplifier like that LaCroix one, that's the one you want. So there's no absolute requirement for actually having the 50 ohm termination here. If you've got a proper differential uh, preamplifier, they're usually uh, high impedance. You know, they'll be 1 meg or 100 meg or, you know, really high impedance. And you don't have to do that. But if you are going to turn them in, turn terminate them like this, like you do for a scope, then, well, you're basically looking at, you know, transmission line stuff, and you're supposed to match source and load impedances, so you don't get reflections and things like that. So if you are doing that, yeah, proper 50 ohm source impedance and 50 ohm load over there is the way to do it. And if you were doing this with the homebrew probe approach, of course, you would keep absolute minimum uh, these paths in here. You wouldn't have anything exposed, so you'd have your coaxes, something like that. You'd have your 50 ohm in series. It'd be nicely heat shrunk, and you'd have your tiny capacitor, and you'd connect it directly across your bypass cap of your power supply to be measured. But, you know, really, that's just a do-it-yourself sort of a custom hack if you need to. As I said, by far, the best way to do it is to use a proper differential probe, preferably with a preamp for measuring uh, low noise power supplies like the Rigol one we just did.
And here's the money shot. You know how I told you that the reason we're doing this differential measurement is so that we can see if this noise that we're getting, I'm single-ended probing on back to my Rigol supply here. So we get that really horrible noise on there, those spikes. We wanted to know if those spikes were actually coming out of our power supply. Well, if we go up here and take a look at our differential measurement, look. We're probing the exact same point. No, look, they're gone with the differential measurement. They're not there at all. So that noise is not coming from the power supply. But if you're using that single ended probing technique, then hey, you could be easily fooled into thinking that power supply was a lot noisier than what it actually is. And if you're curious to know the uh, frequency of that noise, well, it's around about 142 odd hertz between those with two spikes there and there. So that's being picked up somewhere from something in this room. Aha, I found the culprit. It's part of the test setup. Check it out. That's the waveform we're getting now. And, but look, what I've done, I've disconnected my electronic load and I've got connected just a resistive uh, dummy load here. Similar amount of uh, current, we're taking two and a half amps instead of two amps, but it's vanished. Bingo, it's only when I use connect up my electronic load, it's adding that switch in there at 142 hertz, it's coming from this damn load. So you've got to be careful of your test setup like this and where your noise is coming from. And if we didn't use our differential probe in here to actually confirm that, we would have thought for sure that it was coming from this Rigol power supply. But it wasn't. This thing's clean as a whistle and this thing is a culprit adding, you know, normally not an issue, but when it's coupled in like this, well, it causes all sorts of stuff, common mode. So that's to do with the, you know, the design of it. Who knows where it's picking it up internally, but it's definitely coming out of here and interfering with our test setup. Ta-da! So there you go. That's the basics of ripple and noise measurement for a power supply or maybe even one of these brick converters or your circuit or whatever like that. And we've looked at single-ended probing. We've looked at common mode noise. We've looked at differential probing. We've looked at, uh, you know, secret attenuation in your crow probe. Crow, cathode ray oscilloscope probe. That's what we call them here in Australia anyway. Um, yeah, your scope probe. And, well, there's lots of traps for young players. There's a lot of art which goes into actually getting real proper measurements on these things and knowing exactly what you're doing and not being fooled, especially by common mode noise. Just because you see it on your scope doesn't mean it's actually coming from your device under test. So anyway, I, probably there's some stuff I haven't covered in there as well. And yeah, there's, there's a lot of dicking around to try and do this right. But hope you learned something there. And if you liked the video, please give it a big thumbs up. Beauty. And if you want to discuss it, jump on over to the EV Blog Forum. That's the place to do it. Link is down below. Catch you next time.